I had the pleasure this past week of attending the last part of women's group on Tuesday. Um, and one of the topics that came up uh, brought to my attention, I really need to go over this again. And th that's going to happen with many topics. So it's not a big deal. Just the understanding of we want to make sure we get a handle on these things so they don't get a handle on us. Now, before I go over what that topic is, I'm going I'm to start off with an example of something that will hopefully get our attention on how we see wisdom, how we see uh, things as being wise. Well, when I was younger um, and I was in I was in middle school and the gentleman, uh, the other part of this story, he was in high school and it was during a time where high school and middle school in this area was all one school before they split up. OK, so while we were in there, when we get off the bus, we had to wait in this room or the hallway until they let us in the school. And when it was cold, all of us were in there. So the topic of marijuana came up. And I do remember, you know, people were in there talking about how it's illegal, how it's dangerous, how it can kill people and why do people do it? And I remember him. He was known as one that used it heavily. And I remember his response was, why would God make marijuana if he didn't want us to smoke it? Now, everybody in the room was like, ooh, wow. Now, we're all young and kind of impressioned, and we don't have what we need. And this would have been an excellent place to understand God's word. But at the time, I still was very, very, very green on that. So I'm kind of sitting there, and it hit me with a whole bunch of other questions. Why did God do this? Why did God do that? What it, ca what it came to me in an understanding, it let me understand if I were to ask this other question, if I were driving my car and I ran over animals and then somebody said, Keith, why are you running over animals? And I said the comment, if God didn't want me to run over animals, why did he create cars? Well, the obvious answer is he created it for other reasons. And that goes with everything God created. So now I'm saying that because I think we allow our feelings to give us false answers. We allow our feelings to point us in the wrong direction. So this order of my steps is understanding feelings. Now, first of all, before we dive into the scripture and gain understanding of it and then how uh, to keep feelings in check, there are a couple of things I want to make sure I set straight about feelings. First of all, feelings should not be seen as a compass, which is seen as my guide, but as a thermometer, which is seen as where I'm at in reference to where I should be. You see the difference. So in other words, when I'm mad, then I don't tell everybody I'm mad, so you must. I'm mad, so I reacted. I'm mad. Do, do you understand that? I don't, because I'm happy is the only time I can do this, and then I'm just going to, you know, bum everybody out if I'm not happy, but my happiness is the thing that's going to make me have a good day or not. That cannot exist for Christians, even though you see us doing it all the time. That's a compass. That's never meant what uh, um, feelings were supposed to be made for. However, they're a thermometer. You know, I think the human temperature should be like 98.6 or something to that effect. So the reference number, see that as God. And it's a point that stays there. So whatever else I am outside of that is showing me where I'm at in reference to God. Do y'all see where I'm going with this? So if I have a temperature of 105 or a temperature of 76, uh, there's danger, immediate danger. Do you understand that? And I got to be rushed to a hospital, you know, if it didn't already, you know, hurt me or, or kill me. So each case we have to understand that reference is there. That's a feeling. Where am I at in reference to God? You see, under, undesirable feelings can cause triggers, PTSD, anger, depression, and anxiety. And if you've heard me say this over and over again, these are very real things. And the world doesn't know how to deal with these things. And Christians should know because they exist, but he shows us what we have in our ability through him. We all have this, and I'm going to show you that, okay? And conversely, desirable feelings can cause distorted expectation, bad decisions, life-changing choices. How many people do you know are in a relationship that at the time they were convinced because there was the desire of that relationship is why they made the decision. And then years later, not just because of the same feelings, but recognizing where they're at in God, why did I make that decision? I see this happen all the time in both the undesirable and the desirable feelings. 
we are not realizing we are trying to make God adjust to us instead of us realizing we must adjust to God. That's the keys. Now, with no exceptions, our overall life purpose must be through faith. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 7 says, we live by faith, not by sight. Very small um, verse, and it, it gets right to the point, and it gives us the immediate answer. What do we live by? Faith. It didn't say what you've seen, what you've experienced, and what you surmise. No, faith. This is why it frustrates me so many times when I hear people talk about the apostles who were used as instruments to write the Bible as if they sat down and a thought came to them. What they experienced, they decided to write. None of that is that. It, faith is what God gives, period. Sight would be what they see. So it's a command for us. So keep that in mind because it's going to keep this whole feeling things in check. Okay, faith. Now, feelings are wrong understand this, when they go against faith. So I always have to check them. If I'm angry, okay, because somebody did something to me, anger makes me want to retaliate, makes me want to, you know, do something to hurt them, so on and so forth. A focused Christian walking by faith immediately goes, "Uh uh-oh, I'm angry. I better keep that in check so I can react as he says. He tells me to continue to love my enemies, and he said, vengeance will be mine. And I'll find peace, once again, this is all spiritual, in him, in God, while I'm showing love to the person that harmed me. Crazy, isn't it? But Christians should understand that. I'm going to give you an example. A Christian goes with their feelings to marry an unbeliever and ignores what God says about being unequally yoked. Now, I put the verse there if you want to read that, which is a clear verse, but I've seen this dynamic happen many times. I will never officiate those. However, I've seen ministers that have. And what will end up happening, one of two things happen. The Christian who married the unbeliever will realize, man, I made a mistake, or the Uh, the non-Christian usually pulls them away. It's very, very rare that it goes the other way where the unbeliever becomes a believer. It's very rare. But the disobedience in the beginning is because they went with their feelings, not with what God says. Now, God shows that Christians have the ability to stop the effects of feelings. Okay, so just I want to start from the beginning to let you know so you're not saying, well, I can't and I feel because you let your feelings tell you you can't do this. But look what he says in First Corinthians seven, verse 30. He says, those who mourn as if they did not and those who are happy as if they were not. Now, did you catch that? So when I'm going through a mourning and it's a real thing because you a loss and it hurts some people, it'll consume them. It'll take them over. And and that feeling may be overwhelming and it can last a long time. Once again, very real feeling. But when I act upon it, I've seen people who lost their jobs, who go in a room and are there forever. Uh, Their health goes downhill because of mourning. Now they're being driven by that mourning instead of spiritually dealing with. That's why he said, as if they did not. I'm still going to work and run a regular day. Now spiritually, and I'm going to show you later how this process works. There are two major things. And he says, those who are happy, he even went to the other side. Because when we talk about feelings, people who have the biggest struggle or think they have the biggest struggle are those who have the undesirable feelings. But no, it's also those who have their own happiness, their own feel good. There are people who get into certain things they're not supposed to. The Bible is very clear on certain relationships. But because those relationships make people happy, they find some sort of way of accepting them. Don't let your happiness guide you. I've heard some people say a ridiculous thing as I was having a good day and you ruined it. We we give people the power through our feelings to dictate how I'm going to be. Should not be. Now, feelings are a product of the flesh, which battles with our soul. The Bible gives us a clear description. And we see that the only way to win that battle is with Jesus. In Romans 7, 21 through 25, he says, so I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. Okay, he's saying this because he's showing the battle between what God says and how I feel. He says, for I delight in the law of good, I mean of God. In other words, I want to do what God says. So that's my conscious way of thinking. However, and this is in my inner being, 
pieces, but I see in my members, let's talk about the members of my body, another law waging war against the law of my mind. What is that? That's your feelings. Even though I know what God says, I'm clear about what God says, I feel. And he says, and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. So I'm, I'm giving in to how I feel over what God says. This is an ongoing process. Now, when I get what he says in verse 24, what I truly am, wretched man that I am. Why is that so necessary? Because my feelings then won't have the weight that I give to them. A lot of us think, because I feel, then you should respond. Instead of recognizing my feelings can really be deceiving. We're going to see that a little later. So then we ask the question, who will deliver me from this body of death? He's showing that the problem is, and when he talks about the body, he's talking about how I feel, how I think, anything that's related to the flesh. He gives the answer. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then I myself serve the law of God with my mind. In other words, I only do what he says. But if I give in with my flesh, that's why he says, but with my flesh, I serve the law of sin. If I go with how I feel, I'm going to sin. Hopefully you're grasping this. This is so important. Now, we have to avoid uh, living for fleshly desires, which are the product of feelings, because it will disrupt our walk. Not may, will. He gives this warning in 1 Peter 2, verse 11. He said, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers. So let's start that process off first, what we really are. Now, why is this so necessary? Because when I'm in a place, we usually allow that place to uh, describe us, to give us our characteristics. I remember when I came from Pittsburgh and I went to school in Philadelphia, they went, you Pittsburghians is what they used to call me. We had a little bit of an accent compared to them. We did things a little different compared to them. You know what I mean? It was a lot of things that were different that where I came from uh, described me. What he's saying to us is we eliminate all of that. I mean, we're still going to have the physical attributes, but that still is not what I am. I realize I'm from heaven. That's what I have to represent. That's what they need to see. The heaven part of me, not I'm a Smith and the Smith family, blah, blah, blah. No, we don't do that. I'm, I'm from Pennsylvania and you know how Pennsylvania. No, we don't do that. I'm a black man and African-Americans make sure. No, we don't do that. I'm a child of God, and everything I do must represent that. So he says, as this person whose characteristics have to come from heaven, he says, to abstain from fleshly lust. Now, the reason why I use the New American Standard version uh, for this verse is I wanted to make sure, because some will say sinful lust, and, 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 and some people are deceived. The minute they see sinful, it's not talking about them, because too many people think sin is what they think is bad. And they don't realize there's a whole lot of stuff that they're doing that is very sinful. We're going to see that a little later. But he's talking about any desires that come from me. Do you understand that? He said abstain from them. To abstain doesn't mean not to do them. To abstain from it in, in this, in this uh, situation, it means recognize they're dangerous. They're only a request, if you will. Never see them as a must. And there's going to be times where it's going to feel like a must. But if it's not in line with God, you know what the answer is. That's why he says, which war against your soul. Too many people give how they feel versus what God says, as if, what do I do? Well, the answer is always the same. What God says. That does not change. That is the answer. Do you understand that? I'm going to follow what God says. So my feelings will go, I would like this. And I check with God. And as long as I'm grounded with God, then we're good. If not, no. Feelings control, feelings control fools is what the Bible shows us. Okay? Not to be insulted, but those who are controlled by their feelings. In other words, the answers that they do, the basis that they work on and live on, if it's based on how they feel, that's a fool. So we must be wise, which all Christians have access to. True godly wisdom, as you heard the story earlier, when that guy gave what everybody thought was wisdom, a person would go, well, that, based on the Bible, that was a foolish answer. Because how do you know God created that marijuana for you to smoke? 
Amen. Okay, because as you're going to see, well, let me explain that. Some of the reasons God creates things is for the purpose of our obedience. Think about the tree in the garden of the knowledge of good and evil. The purpose for that, it was not to be eaten. Now, you get that same guy going, why would he create a tree just like all the rest of the trees if we can't eat it? That's what Eve ended up doing, making her human reasoning to make it sound wise. And it was a foolish statement. Instead of them checking with God who said, do not eat off this tree or you will die. Do y'all get this? Proverbs 29 verse 11 says, a fool vents all of his feelings. That doesn't just mean he, he blabs it. and he's, It means I get full run of it. When I'm angry, oh, you're going to know I'm angry. When I'm happy, you're going to see my happiness. When I'm sad, everybody's going to feel my sadness. And that shouldn't be how it is. And that's what's called a fool. It shouldn't be that. I'm not saying you're not going to have moments where you're down and you're going to have moments where you're going to smile. I'm not saying that. I'm saying where it consumes you. It's the utmost thing of what you are. Right. I've had times even with my wife when we would get into conversations, things like that. And, and when when I knew she was upset and I say, are you OK? And she says, yes. But you could read it all over her body language. And I know I do. In fact, I do it more than her. She's much better at making that go away. But what we learned to do was, I'm okay, but I just got to figure out how to make sure I deal with it. That's that battle that we're going to talk about later. You let the person know, I'm okay. In other words, I understand where I need to be. Just give me some time to get there because I allowed myself to get somewhere else. That's why he says, but a wise man holds them back. Wise man doesn't allow that feeling to come out. People have said things that angered the heck out of me, but I, I, can't, I didn't show my anger. I may have talked to somebody later about it. I'm going to pray about it. But that feeling was overwhelming that I could have just snapped and I did not. We tend to get misled due to our enthusiasm when our when our enthusiasm is for the wrong thing. This is a very common practice with our feelings. Um, and you have to understand books, podcasts, speakers, uh, even some churches are going after your feelings. Um, you understand this, and this is why people try to make it, oh, it's all demonic. When you hear this type of music, it's love music, that's demonic. It wants you to lust in this music. It wants you to do. It, 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 what it is, is hitting against the flesh. Do you understand it? And these things have that effect on you. And Christians are not affected if I'm walking spiritually. I mean, watch how they'll turn lights down low and stuff like that for romantic songs. And they'll turn, you know, the lights will go a certain way for getting you excited. So I have to keep in perspective what I have zeal for. What am I excited for? I've had many times where I ran into people that were excited about something. And if I were to say anything that, that didn't feel that same energy, you'd get a, why can't you just be happy for me? How come you can't feel what I'm, why do you always have to be negative? And I usually have to step back and wait and then they'll come back, okay, maybe I overreacted. Galatians 4 verse 18 says, it is fine to be zealous, provided the purpose is good and to be always and not just when I'm with you. Point of it is, if I'm excited about it, I'm going to be excited about it always. Why? Because I look deep in it and it's from God and God is always. We got things that we were excited about last year. Oh, that's old news. That temporary for the moment stuff is very dangerous. And then you were standing for it and fighting for it. If it was godly, you'd stand and fight for it to the day you die. Pay close attention to some of the required characteristics and actions Christians must display despite feelings. For example, Romans 12, 9 through 13 says, love must be sincere. Let me make very clear. When the Bible says uh, sincere, the world teaches sincerity is based on you. That's why you heard people say, well, I can't apologize if I don't feel sorry. And they'll go through life and not apologize. And that's how distorted the world is because it, 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 it depends on or trust in this corrupt body. True sincerity, and there's a verse in the Bible that shows, I think it's in Titus, um, and if you're interested, I'll find it. True sincerity is based on God. In other words, why, Keith, why are you doing that? Because God said, even if I don't feel that's true sincerity. So love must be based on God. Then he says, hate what is evil, cling to what is good. You'll have something to go, okay, yeah, I do that, amen. Or are you doing it? Because in many cases, a lot of us allow our feelings to define what is evil, define what is good. 
And we cling on to what we think is good, which may not be good at all, and vice versa. You see where I'm going with this, okay? When I'm focused on God, I have to do this because there's going to be things I really feel for and whatever and realize it's wrong, can't do it. He says, be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Now, I'm going to stop here for a minute to kind of lean towards, because a lot of people who are on the undesirable feelings, it was because of what somebody did or said or treated. And like I said, PTSD, it could have been an event they've been at. But if you are on the other end and you treated somebody bad, and I've had this and I've heard this said multiple times, and it's so frustrating to hear this from Christian people, they'll say that other person needs to get over it. This whole study and what God says, that's not what he's saying. He's not saying to get over it. That's a man-made uh, out, uh, a man-made answer to get over it. It's not what he says, because the feelings are going to be there. There is a way of dealing with it. So when he says be devoted to one another out of brotherly love, that means it's not because of the situation, not because of what they did. It's going to be brotherly love, which is a godly love for our Christian brothers and those who are close and we treat them as close as family with the understanding of there is accountability, there is adjustment, there are things you may have to do, but you don't use it as a record of wrong. So that for those people who did cause harm, they should be going out of their way to help that person to now deal with what you did. That's a big part of repentance. That's why it says, honor one another above yourselves. Verse 11 says, never be lacking in zeal. And we just read about that. So it's very good to be excited, but it should always be about God. Too many times I hear people get excited about their concept of God, and it's disturbing because now you got to wait for them to come down. Then you try to redirect them, and then they do it again. Instead of them always, when they have zeal for God, you don't have to change anything, and their actions and their response and all that will always be in line with God. He says, but keep your spiritual fervor. That's how I can always do it for God because my spiritual fervor is based on the Spirit, not on us. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Not on excitement. This is why you'll get people that go through ups and downs, through spurts when it comes to serving God, because they're doing it off a of feeling. I have a feel good. Let's go do good for people. Other than that, nah, I don't feel like it because we're doing it off a of feeling. Then he says some things here. He says, be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Now, he's showing us the, the situation we're going through and how we're to be, keyword be. We have full control, as we saw earlier. So I have this response of, Keith, this is what you are to be. And what does he say? Joyful in hope. So when I'm going through things that I'm hoping for, because usually hope is a waiting. You have to go through it. And sometimes we get discouraged. Sometimes we get sad. Sometimes we get. But we know the hope in Christ's return is the main thing. He says, during that time, you need to display joy. Don't mistake that for human happiness. Joy is a state of mind based on God. Happiness is a feeling based on man, based on uh, the flesh. Okay, in in the in this in this uh, element, I don't want y'all to to hold just that word because we can still use happy because blessed actually means happy, and we're talking about true godly happiness, which is joy. So we can talk about that later. Then he said, patient in affliction. He's basically saying this bad situation, affliction, which hurt. He's like, I need you to be patient. There's certain thing God allows us to go through and it hurts. And we go, oh, God, I'm praying for you to take it away. And it's not that he said, no, he said, OK, I, I, I need to stay in there a little longer. Remember, he left Joseph in jail longer. We don't really know why, but because he did it. And Joseph was patient and faithful in prayer because it's very easy for us to stop praying when things don't fall our way. I heard people say, I tried and it didn't work. And now they're done. No, it's, I'm going to keep doing it. I didn't see anything work. I'm going to keep doing it because I trust in him. He says, share with God's people who are in need and practice hospitality. These are what we're supposed to show all the time. You hear me? All the time. We have too many people that want people to adjust to their feelings instead of us being godly, no matter how the people are. Now, we must realize our feelings are are as unreliable and misleading as everything else on the earth. Only God is dependable. Pay close attention to this because it's something that if we don't get, we're going to keep going into things thinking I'm right. 
When it says in 1 Corinthians 4, 3 through 4, it says, I care very little if I am judged by you or uh, by, um, I'm sorry, by you or by any human court. So what it's saying is no human being, and I remember this was life-changing for me because I was one of those that was heavily affected by what people said. Now, I can make up my mind, and we're going to see how that works in certain matters, where I could say, I'll go to my wife and say, does this look good? Because I just want her opinion on it. Others may go, that's stupid, that doesn't make sense, and so on and so forth. I want to hear what my grandkids say sometimes because they give me other effects on it. So that's me making the choice to do that. However, the final say has to be with God because I'll hear people give advice and I'm always listening to the biblical foundation for pastor. You should, I've heard it on my dress. I've heard it on how I speak. I've heard it on how the sermon should be structured and I'm listening. And I always heard, I like, I think I feel. And I, I, I'll adjust accordingly, but if it's not based on God's word, sometimes it goes right to the trash. That's what he says. I care very little. It's just, it's just not something that is going to move me. Secondly, he says, indeed, I do not even judge myself. Why? Because I'm just as unreliable. And he shows how. He says, my conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. Just because I feel like, how many of you did something say, I don't feel like I did anything wrong. I hear people say that all the time. And this is where arguments and all that stuff happen, because we get into things with how I feel. And you should feel the way I feel. What makes you right? So I don't judge myself, right? I'm very careful. You know, me and my wife have been argued in years, and not because we're some special, spiritual, extra, whatever. No, we've understood the dynamics of this. We still disagree, but now we can talk it through. She may, she may do something, and I'll say, baby, next time, can we blah, blah, blah? Instead of her going, fine, and getting an attitude and being mad at me, hers is, what I did was blah, blah, blah. We watch the tone. We watch what we say. We watch how we say it. And it'll make me go, oh, I misunderstood. I thought blah, blah, blah. And she was like, she'll go, no, I blah, blah, blah. And I'll go, okay, I get it. I'm sorry. Or we go, I, can we do this? And, oh, okay. Next time we'll do it. That. That's how you, you go into it, not judging based on you. Or if I was judging based on her, what God shows us is I got to keep peace. That's why it says it is the Lord who judges me. In the end, he's not going to go, yeah, man, you were right. He's going to go, what did I tell you to do in every predicament, Keith? Right? You see, a major danger when we are controlled by feelings are arguments. James 4 verse 1 shows that whole dynamic. You know what I mean? Which the, the way I feel is what causes arguments. Right. And there's another verse I don't have that off the top of my head, which tells us we are not to argue. We are not to complain. And it also causes sin and death. The evolution of sin that we see in James 1, 13 through 15 really shows as well how we get to sin. And it starts off with our feelings. We must not deal with feelings the way the world does. OK, mental uh, illness is a major problem. And the world doesn't know. On the parts that the world does handle, they're not handling it wrong. I mean, handling it right. And that's the key. God shows us how we're supposed to be. He says in Romans 12, verse 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world. He was like, now, because the world, um, as you see, and I think it's in 1 John, uh, where he says, or St. James, one or two where it says, no longer conforming to the patterns of this world. Um, I'm sorry, where it tells me, do not love the world or anything in the world. Anyone who loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. It's letting us know that the world is set up to, to, to you know, for you to cater to your feelings, and the world is here to please you in you. Do you understand it? He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Where many are failing is that transformation has never happened and you're still doing things the way you've done it. If you were a combative person, you're still a combative person. You may not be as combative, but you're still combative. I see people who had attitudes, their attitudes just got not as much. And they're stopping. They think they'll always go back to, well, I'm better than I used to be. Okay, that's great. Are you still growing? And we should see a growth. You know, we get comfortable in the fact of that I'm better, not I'm not doing that. This is our guidance to really be in God's will. He says, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. And many, if not most Christians, have no idea what his will is. 
just for this reason. So with all that knowledge of, of how feelings work, and I'm hopefully it cleared up a lot of things, let's understand what is the correct place for feelings in a Christian's life. Now we're going to get that answer of what did, why did God give us feelings. First of all, when it comes to what's called disputable matters, which are topics within the boundaries of faith, it allows each individual to have their own point of view within that boundary. We are to respect others' feelings in that boundary. What does that mean? So in Romans 14, 1 to 3, he says, accept him. What does that mean? You're doing something. It says, accept him whose faith is weak. He already made clear, well, he's, he's wrong, but it's not condemningly wrong. It's not hellbound wrong. As to accept them whose faith is weak without passing judgment on disputable matters. Disputable matters are those, are those things where you can't agree to disagree because they're within the boundaries and they're just, I want to do it this way. Okay, that's fine. And you want to do it this way. Okay, that's fine. Do you understand that? Which we already have those things. Those things are in place. And that's what we go by. All right. He said and gives an example in verse two, one man's faith allows him to eat everything. But another man whose faith is weak, but he makes that clear to make his note, you could still be wrong. You could still be wrong, but it's just not condemnable. Eats only vegetables. I know some people who only listen to gospel music. Amen. And then you have others. I listen to all kinds of music. Amen. You understand that. And you have to understand if they're doing it and it's not against God, hell bound, don't make it up. And that's what many churches have done. We've made up sins that are not sins. He says, the man who eats everything must not look down on him who does not. And the man who does not eat everything must not condemn the man who does. For God has accepted him. This is such an important part when we go into things because there are going to be that boundary that I have that I can make a decision. Now, make sure my decision I don't force on you. I've had people, and I've talked about even with dress, uh, I've talked about, like I said, on speaking and stuff like that, in which they wanted me to do this thing. And I could biblically show them, well, this is why I'm not. But you still see them holding on to what they wanted. That you can't force your feeling on. Now we have a problem. Now we have a problem. I've had to do that many times where people brought in ideas and ideologies that they wanted to give to others or force upon others. Do you understand this? Instead of recognizing, no, that's a disputable matter. If that's the way they want to do it, amen. Now, if the person wants clarity on it, by all means, we are to give it to them. We have to see also that if our feelings fall outside of faith and we react based on them, we sin. He didn't say weaker faith because the person still had faith. It was just weak. But when I have no faith, when it's not based on God, what I did it's sin. This is what I said earlier. A lot of people, their version of sin, they have a whole list of things that they call sinful and a whole list of things that they call all right. But I don't care what you do on that list. If it's not based on God, you sin. He says in Romans 14, 23, but the man who has doubts is condemned if he eats because his eating is not from faith and everything that does not come from faith is sin. Do You see the key? Everything that does not come from faith is sin. Think about that. So my feelings are always going to want me to do something that I feel strong about. Remember that whole zeal thing. Our feelings are usually based on what we want and or how we see it. And these are never to be the basis of our actions. Never, ever. Philippians 2 verse 3 through 4 says do nothing. He makes that very clear. Make sure this is never happening out of selfish ambition, that's what I want, because that's going to be based on how I feel, or vain conceit, how I see it. That's based on my sight. It says, but in humility. So uh, I, I, I'm using this like with me and my wife, and I gave the dialogue of how we deal, deal with things. This is why. Because if I went into it with selfish ambition and vain conceit, she'll do something that'll irritate me. So I react out of irritation. Why? Because it irritated me. I made it about me. That's what feelings do. Make it about you. Reading this, I'll go, I feel irritated. So I'm going to bring it to her attention in a loving way. That's where the in humility consider others better than yourselves. I try in the most loving way to present it, accepting the fact I could be dead wrong. I could be the problem. You understand that? 
in humility consider others. So then it'll allow us to do what verse four says, each of you should look not only at your own interests, but also the interests of others. Many, many, many times I found out I was wrong. Many, many, many times others found out they were wrong. You understand that? And we were able to adjust and everything was good. But when I get defensive and I put my shield up, I react off of how I feel and how I see it. Totally unacceptable by God. He's not going to sit there and go, yeah, Keith, you were right. Because he's going to say, but what did I tell you to do? I didn't ask you on what was right or wrong on this. What did I tell you to do with this? Like Jesus, we must pray about it instead of stewing in our feelings. Mark 14 32 through 34 says, they went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Do you understand the feelings he's going through? So Jesus even went through these feelings. And we're going to also show the overall way of how Jesus beat this, and we have access to it. He said, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. This is just overwhelming feeling. And some people will get here and because it's overwhelming, that's their excuse. In fact, we have a lot of people and you'll hear news sources sometimes give people a pass saying because they were overwhelmed with this emotion, their mental health, and we give it a pass. That's why he said to them, stay here and keep watch. So he went to pray and we hopefully know the story how he prayed three times. And this was a long time because the disciples kept falling asleep. And then eventually an angel came and strengthened him. All of this stuff because he trusted in God, even though he strongly felt otherwise. Must live God purposed while being in uh, control of self. These are two things I'm about to read on now how to do it with the final thing of the whole main, the final. So it's going to be three things. So the first thing, 1 Corinthians 9, 26 to 27 says, Therefore, I do not run, I, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, watch this. I beat my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I will not be disqualified for a prize. Now, I can use happiness, anger, sadness, but here's a good, a better example is hunger, because hunger is a desire. It's all it is, a feeling. I would like something to eat. Now, when people go on diets, how do they beat their body? They'll go, we're not eating this, and we're only eating at this time. Your body's not going to go, okay, good. The body will hurt it go through things. And you're beating it by ignoring it. You're beating it by not doing what it requested. Do you understand? To where it realizes, yeah, I can't win. Do you understand that? That's beating your body. Okay. That's one thing. The second thing is we must spiritually deal with how things affect our thoughts and how we are affected by our thoughts. These are weapons of God. There's three of them in here, but they're fit. I'm looking as one package on our thoughts. First of all, 2 Corinthians 10, 5 through 6 says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. Anything that goes against God's word, which means I must know God's word, eliminate it. I'm not going to give it time. I'm not going to argue with it. I see a lot of people on TV saying some nonsense and things like that. Unless somebody wants to get clarity on it, it will not affect what I do. Second thing, and that's for everything on the outside coming in, then we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. The feelings that come out of me, I always filter them through Christ. Christ, is this right? I don't go, I'm angry, therefore it must be wrong. I go, Christ, I'm angry. And every Christian should immediately go, that's not good. Even if what they did to me wrong, my anger wants to retaliate. It wants revenge. So I I acknowledge that. Remember, that's that reference. I'm not supposed to work or do anything out of anger. Right. Do you understand that? He says, in your anger, do not sin. So I recognize that. And I and I say, because of the feeling of anger, Keith, be very careful. Do you understand that? And then it says, and we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. And then this is in verse six, and we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your obedience is complete. What we won't do is give ourselves a pass. I was having a hard time. It was what I was going through. It was a bad time. We can add that in there, but it's not an excuse. We say, man, I I was dead wrong. God said, no, 
and I still did it. The third thing is the overall foundation following our master, following our guide, following our Lord. The battle we go through with feelings and faith is a necessary spiritual conditioning process. There's a reason why God is allowing us to go through it. There's a reason. And this is why it says in 1 Peter 4, 1 to 2, if you don't remember anything else out of this, hopefully you grab this verse. Watch what he says. Therefore, since Christ, watch this, suffered in his body. What does that mean? I'll explain that. Arm yourselves also with the same attitude. Now, the suffering in your body means I have strong desires. May it be desirable or not, I only do what God says. And you're going to find in many cases what he says is not in line with what you want based on how you feel. And it hurts. There are some people contemplating. We have more people in the world, even in the church, that want to commit suicide. We have more people in the church that, you know, get end up getting drunk or into drugs or in, 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 in affairs and, and things that just Christians have no business doing. And the reason being is they're not suffering in the body. They keep trying to appease the body. They keep trying to please the body. Do you understand that? And it says, our, he gives us the answer. No, no, you need to suffer in the body. In other words, you get to the point, like when we were talking about uh, beating your body, to where eventually your body submits. It succumbs to what you are doing. That's why it says, because he who has suffered in his body is done with sin. I'll never do anything based on how I feel and how I see it. I'll do everything based on what God says. That's why it says, as a result, he does not live the rest of his earthly life for evil human desires. And I think you already know that word evil, the translators added it. Well, I should just say, does not live the rest of their earthly life for human desires. But rather for the will of God. He, he makes it plain how it's going to end. That's where feelings come in. Feelings have to be filtered. Feelings are going to say, but I really want this. And you're going to go, no. Ask any drug addict or alcoholic that stopped. And you're going to, they're going to have this yearning, they're going to tell you. There's this battle that they go through, especially when they first stop. But the ones who master it in God, who master it in God, they understand that's going to be it. But that's not their driving force comes down to understand that the key is to trust God. I told you I struggled with this verse when I was younger, but as I matured, man, it means so much to me. When he says in John 14, 1, do not let your hearts be troubled. Remember, your heart is your purpose. He was like, do not be troubled by that. But he gives the answer, trust in God, trust also in me. What that means is, yep, you didn't like that. Yep, or you really like that. Keep doing what I said. Yep, that looked like it worked. Yep, that really is going to harm you and put pressure on you. Keep doing what I said. Let's keep trusting in him. For the spiritual who deal with those who are emotional. Okay, so this is just a warning and hopefully you pay attention because at times I'm going to be spiritual. There's a verse that says, when you see your brother sin, you who are spiritual, restore him gently. OK, so it's telling us if I see somebody acting upon a fleshly emotion, I who am spiritual, make sure I'm reacting spiritually. It says, remember to be gentle and recognize they are seeing things emotionally or incorrectly and may not be able to receive spiritual things you need to tell them. Now, please make this clear, because some of us will come off condescending and passive because we're not seeing true spiritual things. We're seeing it our way. I've heard people go, okay, whatever you say, why are you getting so mad? How come? And you're just adding fuel to the fire because you're being a jerk. <laughs> Do you understand? You know what you're doing. A true spiritual person will have and they'll know the biblical things. And they're like, I got to get them to see it, not for me to force it upon them. Do you understand that? And you're going to spiritually edit. It'll be how you do it, when you do it. The tone will be different. It will not be this passive aggressive response. Be watchful that you are not emotionally swayed. Watchful that you're not emotionally swayed. It'll happen. 
So in a nutshell, no matter how we feel, we must do what God says. Feelings show where we are in reference to where we should be. Let us pray. Dear most heavenly, most gracious Father, we thank you first of all for your guidance, for what your word gives us on these topics. Help us to always search your word. Allow me and other shepherds to do what we're supposed to in order to feed our sheep with your word, your uncorrupt word, in a way that they can receive it and then live the life with the things that they have the right way. Thank you for your mercy and your grace, because if it wasn't for that, we would have no chance and we'd be in so much trouble. So we're going to keep walking in your ways, looking to do what you would have us do, following you and anywhere you go. We ask you, um, we give you the praise and we want to praise you at all times and all these blessings we ask in your son, and our savior, Jesus Christ's name. We say, amen.